Hi, hello, glad you could join me. Let me show you how I made this child's oversized faux fur coat and the matching tote bag from the scraps. If you want to know what it's like working with fur, I'll be sharing some helpful tips and takeaways from this project. At the start of filming, my cousin's birthday was coming up and she loves pink. Since I have some leftover pink faux fur, it was ideal to make her a gift that would be relatively quick and simple for me to create. Based on the children's sizing chart in my book, Pattern Making for Fashion Design by Helen Joseph Armstrong, the 5th edition, I followed size 14. In the meantime, I'd gone ahead and pre-washed my fur and laid it out to dry. Once I settled on the measurements, it was straightforward to draft the front bodice, back bodice, and the sleeve. Then all that's left is to draft the specific color. I knew I wanted a notch collar, so based on the few images I gathered on Pinterest, I took them as loose references and applied it to my master plan. When it came to my pattern pieces, here's what I decided on. For fur, it consisted of the main body, sleeves, collars, and front facings. As for the lining, there's the remaining side front bodices that will attach to the facing, the back bodice that's on fold, and the sleeves. It's the same pattern as the fur, thus there's only one. I didn't have a matching fabric that would serve as the lining, and since stores were closed at the time, I had to buy online. I found this Cherise Poly Cotton Poplin fabric that would be suitable. It looked like it had a matching color and was fairly affordable. So I laid out my patterns on the table, placed two measuring tapes along the vertical and horizontal planes or axis to determine how much I'd need based on the measurements provided. Knowing the width of the fabric at 112 centimeters, I placed my patterns as I would when cutting with the fabric on fold and took note of the total length. On to the cutting and prep work. Fur is cut following the natural direction of the hairs or pile and is meant to be cut on the wrong side, the back side or flat side. It's easier to cut the backing and not trim away too much hair. Don't get me wrong, it's still going to shed like crazy, but that's the drawback with it. Each time I'd cut out a new piece, I brought it outside to shake off all the flyaways. Pins aren't well suited for this, instead fabric or paper weights are recommended or just household items. Don't need to get too specific. I just grabbed a bunch of mugs. For cutting, I'd say straight fabric scissors or rotary cutters for sure, since there's a lot more control since I can hold the scissors in one hand while the other lifts and ensures that only the backing is getting cut. If a rotary cutter is used, it needs to glide on the cutting mat, thus some hairs will be sadly sliced along the way. If at any point there was a loud snip or thick feeling, then I was definitely cutting Cutting through some hairs. When it came to my notches, instead of the usual trim, I marked them out with a sharpie before cutting. As for prep work, I remember my lecturer in college had told me that you'd have to shave down the seam allowances, but every video I'd watched didn't share that methodology, though there were some that recommended shaving it after the seams were sewn. So I decided to find out what the difference would be. The results are relatively the same. The main difference is when the seam allowances were shaved off prior to sewing, it will be a lot easier on the machine since there's a clear distinction between the pile and the knit backing, so only the seam allowances come flat under the foot. The edges and notches are also clear to see since they're not hidden under the density of the fur. This part is crucial especially when it comes to lining up the pieces, and when attaching the lining with the fur, particularly at the hem, wrist, collar, and facings. But both options still need the extra care in tucking in all the hairs while sewing so it doesn't get trapped on the wrong side. It's easier to do so when the seams are shaved off considering there's less hair, but if any stragglers still got caught and showed on the wrong side, all I had to do was comb them out to the right side as best I could. Either way, it's still recommended to shade down the fur from the seam allowances be it before or after sewing to reduce the bulk on the wrong side. I decided to shave them first so it would be easier on me when it came to sewing. For all my fur patterns, I shaved off 1.2 centimeters or a half inch seam allowance using my dad's wireless shaver and my teasing comb served as a guide to mat the hairs down. I eyeballed it when it came to shaving, it wasn't too bad if I was a little too generous with the close shave cause these little bald spots wouldn't be very noticeable once the hairs were straightened out. I did keep a handheld vacuum ready, cleaning up every now and then. Once all the seams were shaved, I got to work sewing up the collar, shoulder seams, and sleeves before attaching the sleeves to the body. I've seen videos recommending the use of a walking foot, but at the time I didn't have one, but my regular sewing foot suffice. In real time, whilst working on the jacket, my lining order was taking a while, so there was a brief pause in the project. But long story short, I received my lining, panicked about it being a darker shade than what was advertised, proceeded to wash, dry, and iron it before cutting my lining pieces and get to sewing. It's the same process when sewing the lining, but now the side front is sewn to the front fur facing and then attached to the main fur body. I already sewed up the lining back. 
which uh, I have to iron down the seams in a bit. Okay, now I'm just sewing up the shoulder seams together. I haven't gone to the iron yet, so that's why I'm pinning my seam open, being very careful. And as you can see, I'm using the lining side down so that I don't stretch the fur. Making sure my seam allowance, ex no extra fur is getting caught. I did initially want to leave the gap on the hem of the jacket, but I was clearly very tired when I made that decision and realized that it would be better to leave a gap on a side seam instead so that the hem could have a clean finish. Plus, it would be difficult to close up the gap given the different fabric types. So I've done my normal stitch on the top and on the bottom and in the middle, I'm giving myself enough space. You can see that it is just large basting stitches. First, I'm gonna iron this seam flat so I have the nice um, crisp lines so it shows me where I have to sew it back up. But I will open this later so that I can turn the jacket inside out once I'm done sewing the lining. My phone died, but lining is completely done i knot it too close so you can see where my hand stitching knot is and then i just found i caught a little bit on my sleeve but because it's like it's 100 percent done everything has been cleaned up you know sleeves have been lined the whole body has been lined and i've uh, tacked wherever i can so i grabbed the seam from the lining and the bot and the fur on my main fabric and I've tacked them together so that they don't separate if you for instance you see the body has no seam down the back so if I pull on this it will separate from the fur actually now I understood that the fur should have had side seams so I could tack it to the lining considering the whole body can be somewhat separated but I still had a decent amount of fabric to work with from both my fur and lining that I decided I would attempt an almost zero waste freehand pattern to make a matching tote bag keeping it fairly simple to pattern and sew it's pretty easy I need two thin and long rectangles for the straps two rectangular pieces for the main body this is done in two since the the pile would go in the opposite direction if on fold or full. Two rectangular pieces for the facing and the remaining rectangle would be the lining for the bag. I measured out the first scrap or remnant, divided accordingly, cut and followed the same prep procedure. Then I sewed the straps and turned them inside out. I didn't necessarily need my loop turner for this since it's wide enough to easily slide in and out. So just insert it all the way, bunch it up wrap onto the stick. Oh, did you, can, did you see that? It popped out and it stuck. Nice. Next, I sewed up the sides of the body and attached the facing to the lining. At first, I was going back and forth on whether I wanted to stuff the straps. On its own, it was very limp and too pliable. Stuffing it would give it a better grip, so I grabbed some poly stuffing and filled them both, leaving the ends unstuffed and flat so it would be easier to sew. I wish I had shaved down the unstuffed edges to further reduce bulk, but I hadn't decided how much of the strap would be sewn. I marked out where the straps would go on either side of the bag, placed the straps on the right side or outside of the bag, and sewed a square with a reinforced X in the middle on the wrong side of the fabric. This is done in one go for each strap. After that, I sewed the main body of the bag, straps, and facing all together in the round. Then like the jacket, I had left a gap on the side seam to flip the whole thing right sides out. To try to make the hole as small as I can so I don't have to do too much hand stitching, I just... I'm just going to twist this inside out. Yeah, I think I can do a little bit more and then I'm going to back tack. Finally, all that's left was to package the gifts nicely and send them off to the birthday girl on her special day. That's all for this video. If you made it this far, thanks so much for sticking to the end and till next time.